many ways, I think trying to explore space generates solutions to problems that we didn't even know we had. My name is Zena Cardman, and I am the commander of NASA's SpaceX Crew-11 mission to the International Space Station. I wound up doing a lot of research in an oceanography and marine sciences department and studying in remote locations like Antarctica. We spend long duration periods, so many months long, living and working on board that space station. And it's really focused on research. A lot of that research is on our home planet. And a lot of that research is on us as human subjects. I don't think we grow if we don't challenge ourselves. I think that's true for myself. It's true for teams and it's true for us as a society and as a species. We have to take some risks. We have to challenge ourselves in order to push ourselves. I'm Libby Casey, senior news anchor here at the Washington Post, and I am so excited for our next guest to join us. This is a first for me uh, because our remote guest is joining us from the International Space Station. Before we begin, <laughs> we have some technical steps to go through, though, so I get to say something I've always wanted to say, which is that we have to connect with Mission Control in Houston, so please stand by. Houston, Libby Casey here. We are ready to connect with Zena Cardman. You know, guys, I didn't get to do my thing with Houston, but we've bypassed Houston and we've got Zena. Zena, hello. Libby Casey here from the Washington Post. Here from the Washington Post. Hi, Libby. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. It's great to be speaking with you. 11 days since you departed for the ISS, and this is actually your first space flight. Um, what surprised you the most about being in space? It's a funny answer, but I think one of the biggest surprises has been that it isn't surprising. I felt so incredibly prepared for this, and that is largely thanks to an incredible team of people on the ground, crewmates, mentors, training teams, people who built the spacecraft that I'm working on. Uh, I felt really ready for this mission and it's been just such a joy to get to carry it out. What made you realize that you wanted to become an astronaut? We saw in the intro video that you are a researcher. You have uh, a long career working in places like the Canadian Arctic, Antarctica. What made you want to do this? I think that story is different for every astronaut. We all come from different backgrounds, but you're exactly right. For me, I came from a scientific background. I was studying microorganisms and how they affect the chemistry and geology of the environment around them on microscopic and global scales. And I loved that research, but as I grew in my career, I also grew to love the operational side of what I was doing. How do you take a team of people out into the field and go collect samples, maybe when the experts are not actually in the field with you. And how do you do that together in a really challenging environment and then come back and call it mission success? And I really started to get interested in the NASA mission set when I was a student. I was actually a graduate student when I was selected to become an astronaut. And I feel very grateful that I get to apply those skills here with the NASA mission. You were selected from 18,000 applicants. Um, what do you think set your application apart or uh, made people believe that you could do this, that you had the skills it would take to do this? The longer I have been on the other side of that, the more I realize there's a lot of luck involved. Um, I just... I, I, can't, I can't say exactly what it was for me, but I know for all of us who are currently in the NASA Astronaut Corps, we are all not only experts in the field that we came from, but we're expertly flexible. We can learn a lot of different things and we love working in groups, working in teams. 
I feel really lucky that I had a lot of very diverse experiences when I was a student. And so I could not only do the research, but I'm happy to repair the toilet as well. Uh, and so much of what we do when we interview is uh, talking about, you know, how you're going to work together, because that's really what makes a mission, a long duration mission like this one, really successful. The International Space Station is known for having this diverse international team. How do you build trust with your teammates? We spend a long time together training on the ground before we ever fly. And so in a lot of ways that just happens naturally, um, you know, we spend months once we're assigned to a mission training in Houston at the Johnson Space Center and also with our international partners across the world in Japan, in Germany, in Russia. We train in Hawthorne, California with SpaceX for those of us launching on a Dragon, Crew Dragon. And so as you get to work together, you really learn uh, each other's strengths and you learn how to give and receive feedback. You learn when you need to ask for help and when it's your turn to give help. And I think trust is, is the most important part of having a really good functioning team. That doesn't mean that you don't have conflict. It doesn't mean that things are easy all of the time, but you really have to lean on each other when you're doing something like this. Spaceflight is something that no individual can do on your own. You see all those flags behind Xena signifying all those countries to give us a sense of this international cooperation. Well, Xena is the commander of this specific mission to the ISS. So, Xena, I was fascinated to learn that a large part of this is um, studying the human body and what, how it adapts, what it takes to do deep space missions. What sorts of experiments are you all working on? And do you, do you get to figure out the results? Like, are you just putting things in a test tube and, and putting them aside? Or are you getting to learn something in real time? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Uh, you know, we we do get to see results real time. Some of it is just because we're naturally interested. And so we love speaking with the teams at home. In many ways, this is really analogous to what I used to do in the field where I was uh, not so much collecting my own samples or doing my own research, but I was the eyes and ears and lab notebook for a remote team of experts. And I love getting to do that here on the International Space Station. So much of the research that we're doing is on the human body. That includes on my own body. I think it's really interesting that the effects we experience as astronauts being weightless in space are really similar to the stress responses and the human body's responses of immunocompromised populations or aging populations on Earth. And so in that way, the research that we're doing that will benefit astronauts as we go farther and farther afield, going back to the moon, but for long durations, eventually going on to Mars, will also, of course, inherently benefit the people of Earth. And I find that especially fulfilling. Let's talk about the training that you went through prior to launch. You know, there's so much physical training. We've seen uh, videos of you, everything from, you know, getting ready for what it's like to be in a spacecraft that's launching to dealing with weightlessness. Um, but you're also working on preparing yourself mentally and preparing yourself uh, for this really long mission. We're talking about over 100 days so far. What are some of the important leadership lessons that you've learned as, as part of your training through NASA? Yeah, I think there are so many different styles of leadership. And first and foremost, you have to be a good teammate and a good follower. And I think naturally becoming a better leader follows from that. Um, we need different styles of leadership at different times. Sometimes the situation is time critical and you have to be a very assertive decision maker. But most of the time we're in a much more collaborative setting. And so I think being really successful in a long duration mission like this is having mental resilience, knowing what is in your control, when to let go of things, and really having a lot of trust in your team. Sometimes that comes easily for me. Some days I really have to talk myself into it. I think my crew that's up here with me right now is really good about helping each other out in that way. We all have bad days, but we all are able to overcome that together and just really find joy in what we're doing and what we're doing together, especially.
There's so much attention and investment being made right now on space travel in particular, the potential for space tourism. Do you see this moment as, as the beginning of a new space age? Yeah, I do really. And it makes me very excited to see what's ahead. When I first became an astronaut, which was not that long ago, all things considered, there was not yet a commercial crew program. There was not an Artemis program. And just in the time that I have been an early career astronaut, we, we now have this new blossoming of space industry. There are now also multiple ways to become an astronaut. You don't need to be a government astronaut or a NASA astronaut. And I really am excited to see this frontier open for a lot more different, diverse types of people. And I can't wait to see where all of that diversity of experience and diversity of thought brings us in the future as we keep exploring. You mentioned the Artemis missions. You know, Next year, the Artemis True Crew will be flying around the moon, and this is considered to be a key moment for the future of space exploration. What do you hope that that crew is able to accomplish? I am so excited for that crew, and it's just so thrilling to be at NASA and in the world of human spaceflight as we're getting ready to go back to the moon. But we're setting ourselves up to go and stay for long durations and really do something sustainable. I'm also so excited that this time the Artemis program is going with international collaboration. That's been, to me, one of the most profound parts of the International Space Station and this incredible diplomatic collaborative benefit that something like this space station has. So I'm thrilled for the Artemis program from a scientific perspective, of course, coming from my scientific background, but it's really that collaboration and going farther together that makes me most excited. I might actually still be on the International Space Station when the Artemis II crew launches for their journey around the moon. And whether I'm up here or I'm back home watching, I just, I can't wait to follow along. Yeah, let's talk about this moment in science. There have been a lot of cuts to government research, uh, attacks on universities that do scientific research. What are your hopes for Americans, for all of us, seeing the value of the science that you're doing right now, the science you've done throughout your career, and connecting that with something as exciting as, as space travel, but maybe as simple as, you know, collecting samples in, in the icy Antarctica region. Yeah, I think there's something inherently inspiring about the research that we do, whether that's exploring our own home Earth or exploring space, which is also exploring our own home and our place in the universe. But I really hope that people realize as a NASA astronaut, as someone working for the taxpayers, we have a really incredible return on the investment for something like NASA and the NASA mission. Just using Apollo as an example, I think setting a really bold goal like that, but having to do it fast and with not a large budget really drives a lot of creativity. And we wind up with these innovations, things like the integrated circuit that uh, the Apollo missions developed that then lead to benefits like having a phone that I can hold in my hand that has more computing power than an entire spaceship. So I really am excited to see where that development takes us in the future. And I hope that everyone gets to know and gets to see that return on investment. When there are cuts to, to funding, are you concerned about talent and knowledge leaving and going into the private sector, going elsewhere? I mean, you talked about the potential for commercial uh, space exploration, of course, but how do you encourage people to try to work at NASA or get involved in the kinds of work that you've been doing? It's not a concern of mine, but I'm very excited that there are so many different options for talented people who are interested in taking part in human spaceflight. I think we need more than one simple option, one and only option. NASA is, of course, smartly collaborating with a lot of different partnerships, whether that's other government agencies, private companies. And I think having more diversity is actually going to make us stronger. So I'm very excited for this evolution. I 
somehow couldn't believe that the International Space Station uh, marked 25 years recently of continuous human presence. Where do you want this to be in 25 years from now? Yeah, it really is amazing to think about. There are so many people who have not known life without continuous human presence in space. And the fact that we've done this with international collaboration here on the ISS is just astounding. Of course, this space station itself is, uh, I don't think, going to be here 25 years from now. But I'm really, it's, it's such an honor to take part in this groundwork that is laying, laying the groundwork for those future space stations, whether those are in low Earth orbit or as we get ready to go back to the moon for longer and longer durations and eventually farther afield. Zeno, you're talking to a packed room uh, here at the Global Women's Summit, and um, I've seen a couple audience members even tearing up when we first connected with you. Just, uh, it's really exciting for a lot of us to see you and hear about the work that you're doing as a commander of this mission on the ISS. Um, tell us about the rest of your day, and, and <laughs> it's, they're on Greenwich Mean Time. I had to figure this out, right? Like, what time is it where Zena is? It's like, I think about four o'clock. Like, what, 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 from the mundane to the profound, I mean, tell us about the, literally what you're doing today, but also some of the moments that make you stop and, and just sort of pinch yourself that you're where you are right now. Yeah, it's funny that you say that. I think one of my favorite things about being on the space station is that contrast between the mundane and the profound. Um, when we first started this conversation, we were, I think, just flying over the southern tip of South America, and now we're about to cross over Europe. Uh, it's it's wild to be up here seeing 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. I am just dazzled and humbled every time I look out the window. But then literally right before we started this conversation, I was working on fixing the toilet. Uh, you know, we were, uh, we were doing some maintenance. And so the whole team was involved. It was all hands on deck today, uh, fixing some plumbing that is actually going to our treadmill. But in order to access that, we had to remove the toilet stall and put it back. And it's been a whole day affair. So that's what I was doing right before we started speaking. Incredible. Incredible. Well, Zena Cardman, thank you so much for joining us from the International Space Station. It's been such a delight to talk with you. Thank you all so much. I wish I could be there in person, but it's such a treat to get to join you this way. Zena Cardman, stay with us for the next segment of the Global Women's Summit. Thank you, everyone. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you.